by YouTube. Um, if anybody have difficulties uh, at any time to attend the sessions on Zoom, so you could also switch your yourself to uh, YouTube as well. Okay, so uh, just before we start the session, uh, and, and we just wait a couple of minutes for everybody else to join. Uh, it would be good to have some interactions uh, between each other on whoever have joined the session. Um, so uh, very excited to host people uh, from various different parts of the country and also from different parts of the world as well in this session. We got about, I think, 150 people registered for this uh, webinar and we see about 40% uh, of the people uh, registered are from the industry. Um, quite good to know and uh, happy to consider uh, your interest uh, to explore about uh, the sizing simulation and the important importance of it uh, today. So uh, it would be good, good to know your expectations uh, before I start the session. So uh, we have an option available on our chat box. It would be really good uh, to hear your expectation. Um, so I just ping you hi in the uh, chat box. So could you please? Uh, uh, give us some inputs on what interests you to attend this webinar and also um, you know, uh, what are you expecting uh, out of this uh, let's say about 45 minutes of our discussions today and that would set us a bit of an agenda for today's discussion so i myself have an agenda for delivering the session today but though i would like to know your expectations so that i would try to tweak around my discussions to to meet your expectation at the better level um, yeah, so over to you. Uh, the, the floor is open for uh, your inputs. Uh, so please drop the details on your chat boxes. Okay. Right. So, yeah, anyone here? have any inputs or expectations yeah we will get started from your side okay uh, okay i see a message on the chat box so yeah um hello hi hi shashank sir yeah good to see that you know you're part of this webinar today uh nice to know you All right, so I think yeah, we're good to start about uh, 31 people uh, in today's session. It would have been really great to know what interests you to attend this uh, webinar and what are you expecting from this uh, discussions today? Uh, that would have been a great input for us to uh, uh, you know, discuss about today's topic. Okay, we have Satish Patil. So want to know areas of improvement in EV powertrain uh yeah absolutely i think uh, we can we can chat about it uh but yeah i, I think at this moment without knowing a specific project and uh, its requirement in place uh, it, it may be very openly as an answer what i would be defining but yeah we could get get connected and you know explore more to suggest you better answers but as an overall of today's uh, webinar i'll try to touch base on where things can be uh, brought up into our discussions uh, in terms of improving uh, improvements for powertrain in place. Great. So setting this note, let me just start ahead the session. By the way, hi, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for joining to the session on electric vehicle powertrain design using 1D simulation softwares. Uh, this is Suraj. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Decibels Lab. And I'm also the course director for the programs uh, happens at Decibel Lab largely on any of the specific domains. Um, so uh, I'm glad to deliver the session today. Uh, typically, it's been very rarely that I engage in sessions, but it's always interests me to, uh, you know, engage in some kind of sessions like this to interact with all the participants across. And EV is definitely a passionate area, and uh, that's how our whole business was uh, laid upon to start. You know and train on evs in place so very good to connect with all of you and thanks a lot everybody for joining the today's session 
uh, as a part of today's session. So I will be touch basing on how you use the part, how you use 1D simulations to uh, design a part train and uh, why you should actually do it. Uh, I know it's not just uh, connecting some simscape blocks and you know getting the beautiful graphs, uh, but it's it's more than about you know uh, understanding the requirements of the project and designing all of your systems around it, so that you you make the uh, you know system to function to a great extent, maybe in terms of reliability, maybe in terms of efficiency, you know, maybe in terms of. Uh, optimization uh, there are a lot of things you know that you could do as a simulation engineer uh, that only possible if you know what best you can use a simulation tool for uh, so i see a lot of people like you know teach on youtube um, you know uh, uh, on simscape but 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 it's not just about you know you can build models you know it's just equations and then you know, convert them into a model what's so not difficult assembling some set of bolts and nuts to make a vehicle right so that's how it looks like but typically it is not uh, just a simple uh, simulation, but you got you got to derive a lot of information out of it so that you know you can you can build a better vehicle. Uh, so to get you started uh, with that scope of it, uh, let me derive as best as the information I have uh, over this session. Uh, to set an objective, I would give you an idea on um, how we could use simulations and how they impact in the overall sizing of components. Uh, then I'm, I'll be joined with Mr. Krishna. Um, to give you a bit of idea about some of the models as well. Um, so cool. Uh, to start with my slide one, so um, why do we perform simulations? Uh, on the first and very important point of it, every every bit of bat hour of energy is important, right? So if you want to develop a vehicle, so it's not so big, you can just go and buy a set of batteries and you know cells and assemble them and you know, get them into the Pack level and then integrate a BMS from off the shelf and you know connect some sort of cables for your HV positive, HV negative, and a buy a motor controller, buy a off the shelf motor and assemble it. Definitely, it works. You know there is no doubt on that. But but at the very core of it, you know if uh, you are able to optimize the whole vehicle uh, to to reduce the energy consumption and and the beauty itself is completely different. So to give you a uh, a very simple analogy that uh, if you compare Aether uh, with uh, any other competitor products in the market, right? Uh, compare them in, in terms of energy uh, and efficiency of what they use for per kilowatt per kilometer consumption. So Aether has about let's say 2.7 kilowatt battery pack, and you know they promise about 75 kilometer range. So if you put the numbers, I think you get somewhere about uh, 38 to 39 watt hour per kilometer right so but if you take like i cube from tvs if you put the range uh, with respect to uh, you know what you can call it as battery pack size there's a lot of difference in in terms of uh, what energy consumed per kilometer is and what energy consumed per kilometer at ether i mean this is just an example but there can be a potential opportunity for ether as well to improve the energy consumption per kilometer but just to give you an example uh, the whole idea of, of end uh, result is basically how much did you consume uh, to run a one kilometer of uh, vehicle distance, right? And then on top of all these things, and that's been the very core of uh, our typical requirements that, you know, uh, what Marathi says is, Kitna, you know, how much mileage does it give, right? So same way here also, it matters that, you know, what is the lowest consumed energy per kilometer of distance travel? I mean, that depends upon various different scenarios of your driving, but I'm just giving you a typical generalistic scenario. That is being a primary important point. And the secondary important point is also about how do you optimize your component sizes, right? So how do you choose right gear ratios? And you know, all of your energy consumption uh, points out back towards all the components, sizes, and optimizations that you put across your whole system. You know, it could be as simple as aerodynamics, uh, it could be as simple as in terms of the vehicle weight, and it could be as simple as the kind of tires you're gonna use. Uh, it could be also what, what kind of uh, transmission system you're trying to use, what kind of uh, you know driving mechanism are you trying to use, what kind of motors are you trying to use, uh, what kind of motor controller are you trying to use, and what kind of optimization points you're trying to drive your motor under conditions. And did you know whether your motor goes above specific temperature regions 
that it, it loses its efficiency points. So this like in the place, there's a lot of data that comes in and did you choose the right cell that is capable of taking a, a, a beating from the you know current consumption? Did you choose the right cell, a right motor that can pick up specific temperatures of the environmental conditions? So all of these things, you know, even including the parameter that if you deep discharge your cell, what is the you know um, energy that you're going to get out of the cell? So did you know this is going to happen when you put the vehicle in the real time condition? So like this, lot of parameter would just just drop in uh, to define that okay, what is the lowest watt hour per uh, watt hour per you know, watt hour of energy you're going to consume per kilometer, right? So it's it's end day that you know your energy consumption depends upon all of your components, all of your system level integrations, even to the level where you, you put up your aerodynamics and all your vehicle dynamics also into a picture. So, so that, is, that is why you know, uh, uh, simulations are important. So if you uh, consider a specific powertrain model, you know, which is just looks like this, which starts from the defining a chassis of, of, uh, simul for the simulation and then defining transmission and then motor, motor controller and a battery, and then your auxiliary system, such as maybe the HVAC system, or it's, it's for battery cooling or motor cooling, sorry, the battery cooling or battery heating, or also for the motor cooling. And then you have your other auxiliary system, maybe your lighting systems, or maybe any other power conversion system, such as DC-DC converter, or any other system that are involved as an overall vehicle part of it, right? So, so basically, end goal of any of your simulation is to identify your component sizes. Uh, it could be battery, it could be motor, it could be transmission, uh, it could be your conductor, it could be your contactor, it could be uh, your battery management system, it could be your precharge components. Put up all these things together, you want to define your, you know, the sizing for your components. And then end of the day, you want to ensure that all of these components are optimized to the best of its uh, you know, uh, requirements in place and they do, they do work reliably at any given conditions. So keeping that as a goal, this is how the overall powertrain model looks like. And then what are we going to do with each of those models is something that we talk about. So when we talk about uh, the, the major input parameters for powertrain model, so we have a lot of this component, a lot of this parameter that, that comes in as a, a, a simulation inputs. We could start from sim as simple as coefficient of rolling resistance and mass of the vehicle, mass of driver, passenger, uh, grade angle, uh, frontal area of the vehicle, uh, it could be density of the air, the drag coefficient of the air, and radius of the wheel. So the moving ahead on the other areas, like if you talk about transmissions, you have requirements for your maximum grade and your torque requirements, it could be peak torque and a peak speed and a wheel and like other parameters as well that comes as a part of the transmission model. And then the motor model, uh, which talks about uh, torque Talk requirements and then uh, requirement of the motor in terms of the voltage or in terms of the current and various different parameters also for the requirement of regenerative braking and stuff like that. So then we come to a part of a motor controller, talk about motor efficiency, uh, uh, regions of the way you can control a motor and also obviously the parts of your regenerative control as well. So for the battery, we talk about cell voltage, uh, cell capacity, the battery capacity of battery voltage and uh, requirements of drive cycle distance and, and also talk about SOC and then uh, with region controls as well. So when you talk about auxiliary systems, so there are a lot of these parameters. Uh, I would say definitely there are more parameters than what you mentioned here. So this is something that we could just put across as a presentation. Uh, so if we talk about HVAC system, obviously there uh, we, we, we are estimating the energy that is required for cooling of the cabinet, right? So the cooling of the cabinet is defined by various type of heats that has been added into the cabin or removed from the cabin. So the, typically we get to add heat by various different parameters. Maybe there's a reflective heat from the road because the road is hot and it reflects the heat when you're driving on the roads. So it also accumulates to heat up the cabin as well. And you have a uh, reflective load uh, directly getting bumped from the you know, sun to our areas of the uh, uh, windows and maybe in the glass panels and stuff like that. Like this, there are various different type of heat that has been added into the cabin. And then you want to basically uh, study, there is a possibility of heat being added from the battery pack to a cabin as well, if the battery is hot, or if it is a condition of IC engines, you may have some heat generated from the engine compartment into a cabin compartment. So you're trying to add a net positive heat into the 
cabin and then you're trying to estimate the temperature of the cabin and then on the other side you're trying to produce some amount of cooling within the cabin so that to bring the temperature to a, a you know x minus y towards optimal desired temperature so when you want to perform all these things maybe you have metabolic load also that is people inside the cabin can also dump the heat into the cabin so with putting out all these scenarios together so we perform simulations to study okay if you have a hvac system turned on and if the desired temperature is x and your cabin temperature is y so bring the desired temperature to x so y should be uh, subtracted with the value of maybe a something like an you know z so and to perform that to happen so obviously you have to run your compressors and you need to run through all your uh, heat exchanger systems so we studied like what is the heat that has been uh, reduced but end of the day that compressor is driven by and fans are driven by the energy from the battery so you accumulate all those components as a part of your hvac system as well so then we perform something like the 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 sections of uh, you know the battery uh, heating or cooling so what you're trying to do is you're trying to uh, uh, estimate the heat that has been generated within the battery so you know a lot of parameters for the battery maybe it's specific capacity of the the components a specific heat of the components or if any of the components that are being contributing to the heat generation you perform uh, uh, studies and simulations to check whether the heat that is generated in the battery uh, is is at a what magnitude so again we consider where parameters okay if you have, if you want to include let's say liquid cooling you want to perform air cooling uh, you have a technology to only limit yourself to air cooling maybe it's a first generation vehicle and stuff like that so we would perform a lot of studies to check whether whether the whether the battery requires what kind of uh, cooling and that in turn depends upon what is the rate of heating that your battery is undergoing if the rate of heating of the battery is too high right it means if if the value of a rate of change of heat is is very very much suddenly happening or it, it's just shooting up very quickly you can't basically perform that with a air cooling so you have to go for a liquid cooling so we perform all these studies it could be even in the time of driving the vehicle or it could be in the terms of uh, even charging the vehicle as well so we perform those studies to check what is the feasible heat that is at the battery and then then by performing cooling so what you could what kind of requirements are there on the load for the compressor because end of the day you have to supply the the coolant from the compressor itself right so then uh, maybe for a motor cooling as well and then we have your auxiliary loads as well for the whole part of it that was just a, just as part of it and then what you consider possibly to perform uh, your 1d simulations and then there are various different test cases right so we start the model from here if i go back uh, to the chassis so we consider certain parameters and then we consider transmission and then various different components which you have spoken about so uh, if you talk about chassis so obviously it, it is having the the input as a drive cycle the meaning of drive cycle is we want to know if you have to uh, calculate the energy consumed per kilometer or you want to estimate the range that the vehicle can give you or battery can possibly give you right so you have to study that with respect to the different drive cycles so why because let's say you you take an electric bike and then charge it to 100% uh, give it to a uh, three different drivers right so one guy drives it very aggressively another one guy drives it mildly and then somebody else drives it like you know very calm and easy so all of them have a different driving pattern the representation of driving pattern is basically like you know velocity with respect to time right so if you put all the three different graphs and if you if you uh, uh, check the range that the battery has given with respect to three three different drivers it's going to be different right if if one driver who has driven it vehicle very aggressively may have got let's say like 55 kilometers per 100% to 0% soc or if a guy has possibly driven a vehicle uh, little more in a moderate would have given would have got about like 60 kilometers per 0 to 100 one complete charge uh, discharge cycle or if somebody who have driven very mild maybe would have got about 65 kilometers of range so it means that the when you drive aggressively you demand higher amount of a torque and then that in turn demanding higher amount of a current from the battery that means you're discharging the cell at a higher discharge rates right that means when you discharge the cell at a higher discharge rates that is having a very specific discharge characteristics that means when you discharge a cell at a higher discharge rates it would not give you the same amount of energy comparatively when you discharge it at a lower c rates right so all of these things impact end day for your cell selection right if you have not correctly correctly collected a cell 
then you're you're basically not considered your all your driving patterns so to make that happen in a reality so we would start that by performing various simulation with respect to a very desired realistic uh driving scenarios right what government asks you maybe to simulate with urban rural and highway conditions right so that is where you typically expect your vehicle to perform again that is that may not be very realistic in condition maybe what are the drive cycle we have for idc and stuff like that so all of them cautiously define okay according to ai the vehicle gives you like 150 kilometers of a range but when it comes to reality it doesn't even give you 90 or 100 kilometers why because obviously it is it is what government says and there is nothing wrong in companies defining it because that's what it gives you when you conduct the tests in those defined conditions but but it is not the same for a customer at the end day right and it is not just the same for all of your component sizes if you have not done your right sizing of yourself because you just went ahead with some typical rural and highway and urban conditions not considering influence of various different parameters you, your whole powertrain can go bonkers that is when it comes to a scenario of real time driving cycle so we we have to collect extensive amount of drive cycles where we would have different samples of collection with different type of drivers different type of road conditions uh, different uh, you know kind of traffic conditions so all of these things supposed to be collected maybe maybe let's say have have about like like 50 to 80 different driving scenarios that you could define that your vehicle will undergo right so somebody could put like an extra 50 kg on your load so that you could study all these parameters so typical test cases that you run any of your simulation models is is run through different driving conditions it could be any of these again with respect to specific real time drive conditions and coming down to some of the points like you know you could also include your regenerative braking it could add a lot of greater value if you know how much it can add a value but it is not just a simple tech right so you have to make ensure that you know you, you, all your systems is compatible to perform regenerative braking you have your better control strategies uh, to be properly working for regenerative control because it is not only that you're pumping the energy back to the battery you're also making that as your like you know braking system so it could be potentially challenging if you do not have properly tuned regenerative braking system moment the post driver presses a brake so you would have your mechanical brake and also your electrical brake so not just the point that the energy goes back from the motor to the battery but also your all your vehicle dynamic parameters can be compared to a, a real time condition you know expected values of what your customer is expecting expecting or you will create a very unpleasant driving experience for the driver so putting all that driving requirements of the customer's expectation and the other side technology is also required to implement regenerative braking if you are capable to implement regenerative braking study various different scenarios and load conditions and and implement all your control logic because as same as your motoring efficiency regenerative efficiency is not the same on the other side your region cannot be very effective at every different scenarios and if you're driving at a very low speed and if you want to perform region it, there is no use of it so all these scenarios of efficiency of region at the motor and uh, you know uh, effectiveness of regenerative braking and your comparison of your mechanical braking system to an you know electrical braking system if you have everything all in place then only go for regenerative braking so that you can take out some amount of energy and you can be always quantifiable if you if you if you are able to take out the best as possible or if it is really very minuscule so why to put so much of complexities in place to go for regenerative braking so similarly in, in in kind of if you have a hvac system this doesn't matter if you are going for a a two wheeler right but if you are going for a, a four wheeler configurations if you have a an optimum sized vehicle like maruti swift so your hvac system is somewhere at least about 2 kilowatt right so if you run your compressor at a full load it typically consumes about 2.5 kilowatt right but if you if you have an average load condition that is about like a 1 1.5 kilowatt as an average load if you're running your hvac system at an, an optimal uh, desired like you know temperature about 25 degrees celsius your hvac system itself will consume about 1 kilowatt to 1.5 kilowatt per hour at a very average median load conditions but if you have your hvac system to uh, at a very highest load and you know the day temperature is somewhere about 44 degrees celsius and you want your ambient temperature to be somewhere about 25 and you are driving your vehicle at you know peak hot condition so obviously you, you got to have your your energy consumption somewhere about 2 to 2.5 kilowatt per hour 
that means you're drawing energy from the battery. So that kind of a scenario is you need to simulate and study. And just to jump into another condition, so you would have to check atmospheric condition influences and motor temperature also on the battery temperature. And so that you have collected all this data to simulate uh, at various different temperature conditions, what, what have impacts for your motor efficiency and a better battery discharge characteristics as well. Similarly, there are various different test cases, maybe limiting to a motor current. Why do you do it? If your temperature of the battery, so the motor is very, very at a closer point to its, to its maximum operating conditions. So you would definitely limit your battery. So you limit your motor or also the battery so that both of them are in a operating uh, scenarios or within the limited, limited conditions. So check all these conditions and then various different parameters, maybe different load conditions and also simulating with respect to homologations and then simulating for energy consumption and optimizations and uh, selection of right gear, gear issues and various different cases as well. So uh, any questions from anyone uh, until now? So over for the floor to have discussions. So anyone have any questions uh, uh, at this moment? Right. Uh, if, if no questions here, so we'll move ahead. Uh, specifically to start with the first section, the chassis. So the, the requirement of chassis model, uh, chassis is a different name altogether for a vehicle, but, but as a part of our simulation model, the objective of the chassis model, if you have to go back quickly uh, to give you uh, a run through on what exactly was it a chassis. So if you start from here, right, this was a point where we are starting. So the objective of your simulation model is to determine the total tractive force that is desired for the vehicle's movement. So it could be your acceleration requirements, it could be gradability requirements, it could be uh, uh, in a peak and hold performance requirements, or any of these conditions. So you want to simulate with respect to uh, chassis, or you would be simulating with respect to chassis. The ideal output of your uh, uh, the chassis model is to get the resistive forces and then obviously uh, defining the acceleration inertial forces and then going back to uh, you know studying the variation of coefficient of rolling resistance of various different parameters to check its influences and at the end of it you would come to a point to determine a wheel torque and a wheel speed so if you have no transmission in between so you would go for that itself as your torque and a, a wheel speed but if you have a transmission in between, so that is where you convert that into a motor torque and a motor speed. So or if it is a hub motor, then you directly go for a wheel, wheel torque to a wheel speed, wheel to motor torque and a wheel speed to a motor speed in place. So by end of it, you, you run, you give a specific drive cycle input to your model, and then model will give you a desired amount of output in terms of various different parameters like this. Then to a transmission model. So the end goal of transmission model is to identify a desired gear ratio so that you can optimize the size of the motor. The other side, you can also optimize the maximum current requirements by limiting its uh, or lowering the higher torque requirements by optimally selecting a gear ratio. Also on the other side, you could, you could choose the right gear ratio so that you would be able to optimally play the operating points of the motor as well. So yeah, uh, by end of it, you would, you would you, you could do a lot of algorithms. Uh, we have you know uh, something like linear search space algorithms and stuff like that. You can write this algorithm, uh, feed the drive cycle, and you know, feed all your vehicle parameters. So optimally, the the algorithm can automatically select the right gear ratios, and you can define your constraints and what you desire what you desirably want to achieve. Accordingly, the algorithms can you know give you a right desired output. So looks like there are a few questions. Uh, which is a recommended, recommended after studying a duty cycle with or without regeneration? Okay. Uh, which is recommended after studying duty cycle with or without regeneration, right? So, I mean, for the two-wheeler applications, if it is a very small motor size of about 250 watt, it might not be very effective. Again, it depends upon what 
what size of motor do you have and what what performance characteristics you have at the vehicle level so desirable yeah if you have a very simple uh, 250 watt size or a, you know 750 watt size requirements the effectiveness of regenerative braking may not be that really really great uh, that is on the one side and definitely you could look for a feasibility of regenerative braking if you are able to go ahead higher than those the sizes in place and again whether you have a tech to kind of handle the regenerative system altogether that's another point of it so which drive cycle uh, or or uh, will be impactful for you obviously you know you can generate your own real time driving cycle if you are a vehicle manufacturer accordingly you can study uh, whether it is feasible or not feasible yeah it is feasible if you go above specific uh, wattage of the motor size uh, or i would say effective and then also on the uh, you know vehicle performance as well uh, you know what is your braking force and then uh, what is your often braking conditions are you know all these things will come into a picture and what is the efficiency of motor at a region radio system side and uh, parameters of uh, uh, whether your soc conditions of the battery and stuff like that will all bring together to define whether it is effective or not effective but yeah i would i know it is a diplomatic answer but yeah until and unless we would know your exact product requirements uh, the it, it may not be a very specific or a laser focused answer as i would say but yeah those are the parameters that could be considered in place to define this effective or not effective first to select a gear ratio or the motor uh, absolutely a fantastic question so you know it depends upon um, whether you have a supplier who can who can supply you all right uh, a motor that you desire if you are a very large oem um, you have volumes in place obviously people will talk that they can make a motor for you or you have large amount of r and d budgets that you could pump the money for somebody to develop a motor for you right so if yeah that so can happen um in you have a control over your supply chain and stuff like that you would first choose uh you know uh i would say a motor by performing various uh, kind of scenarios uh but if it is at a simulation level uh if you're asking whether you choose the gear ratio first or motor first we would desirably start with um uh, you know running your simulation model and then getting some you know and and vague results to start with and then slowly you you start to define certain boundary conditions uh for your motor size depending upon uh current values or you know, voltage values uh so that you know motor speed is is very you know directly proportional to the voltage that you are able to supply and then the motor talk defines with respect to the the current that you can supply so you would have a constraints on your battery size right you can't just pump out as big battery as possible with the certain considerations and constraints you you start defining requirements for the motor and then you also start defining your requirements of the uh, transmission as well but at a very first point you would not have a very optimal results that you are expecting that okay this is what is a motor size is you would start from vague motor size and then you start to define your parameters and slowly go back and check whether your target values for your battery current and the battery voltage are within the limits what is your motor expecting and then you start going with your transmission and then and start to optimize its uh, size in place so or uh, any questions from anybody else okay so yeah it's a uh, it's good if you could interact uh, we could we could derive some answers out of this meeting um right so yeah it's 604 uh and through because we have now uh, about another 15 minutes to uh, you know finish the session so coming to the part of the motor model so uh, the desired output we are expecting is what is the operating torque what is the operating speed of the the motor and then what are its operating points with respect to the uh, efficiency graph right so and then that is what we are trying to expect uh, and if it is working on a regenerative 
we are expecting what is the voltage and the current that you are able to generate out of the 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 motor during the regenerative conditions so, so that's what you're expecting when you're trying to you know uh, model the motor and uh, we could we could implement again complexities of thermals as well uh, so that you are getting the desired expected temperatures or what is the operating temperatures of the motor if if uh, you're able to run the motor for extensive durations and stuff like that but yeah at, at overall you're expecting to know uh, the desired torque uh, and desired rpm so that your your motor always be within its peak performance requirements and you also know that the peak performance is limited for a time and then your desired selection of your nominal performance of the nominal torque of the motor is within that desired requirement desired manufacturing capability the manufacturing capabilities of the motor so you define a value for your peak nominal performance and a peak performance again we study all of that with respect to 50 to 60 drive cycle so putting it all the data together you would come and close your you know sizing for your motor size or that is basically the torque and rpm and uh, other regenerative characteristics of the motor as well so coming to the point of parts like the controls so you know here you could also implement uh, bringing your electrical expertise to control motors, maybe various different type of control algorithms and you know control strategies in place. Or if you are not focused too much there and do not have an exposure being a mechanical engineer, you could you could initially start with you know simply modeling a motor controller only with desired specific characteristics in place. So if you see here that on the graphs uh, uh, mid here as pointed in the cursor, so uh, it was on the regenerative side, okay. Similarly, the this is where it talks that okay, uh, the region is only done on a specific points here. The region is not done on any other. This is what this is where your motor is operating in the negative torque region. That is what this graph rep represents in the leftmost, and the middle one talks about its operating points in visuals on the plot. And then after implementing the logics that you know we are able to only use the specific part of the uh, regenerative operating conditions of the motor, right? So that is what you're defining your desired, uh, what is available, but what is desirable for your uh, charging into the battery. Again, those parameters depends upon what is your SOC of the battery, what is your temperature of the battery and stuff like that as well. But at, at a motor level, so at a control level, you know, okay, this is what can use uh, at a given requirements in place. Similarly, your operating points will also come into a picture. Right now, what you see here are the operating points of the motor when it is in negative torque. It, it means when it is in a regenerative mode or it is in a braking mode uh, in a simplicity. But when you consider the motor in a motoring mode, maybe the motor would operate in all these conditions. Right? It just, just goes over all the possible places in place. So, but, but again, the motor has a specific efficiency. And it only operates, uh, you know, at a very good region in in few conditions. So the motor operates best here, and then the the less best here, and and something okay here, and maybe very bad here. So you want to ensure the most of your motor operates in this condition, so you have a best efficiency uh, overall at the vehicle level as well. But for that, how do you optimize? How do you choose your motor? All of this would possibly matter into a place. Then coming to the part of the battery, the end goal of the battery is to ensure that you know you have a, a desirable cell that have been selected. So we talk about uh, cell discharge current, right? And uh, specifically, what is the C rate that you are discharging the cell at? Uh, so, and you have performed those fifty to eighty test cases to study whether the cell has been within its discharge limits in all the given conditions and also where you could study the the energy consumption per kilometer uh, where you could study uh, the energy consumption uh, for a specific uh, desired soc maybe from 100 percent to zero percent soc what range that you can expect maybe you can also implement something like influence of temperature 
you can you can conduct a cell testing and at a various different temperature study uh, and and do a curve fitting to check okay if the temperature of the battery is about let's say 35 degrees celsius my discharge characteristic of the cell is this so that i would have to compensate 5% of the energy loss because the temperature of the battery was higher about this value right so all these studies can be implemented as a part of the, the simulation model so that by end of it you are able to get the desired results with respect to the realistic drive case conditions the similar way we, we would perform hvac system i have ran you through some in you know, at the points in place that you know what what possibly possibly is energy consumed by the hvac system if it is something like a maruti swift so you could consider that in influence of hvac system is really really large in the battery pack uh, energy consumption so it could impact on the range of the vehicle as well so you you would perform various different type of con conditions and test cases so that you would be able to check whether your vehicle will be able to hold that range promises when the hvac system is on uh so again going to the complexities of hvac system you 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 just have a very simple hvac system then again what tesla has introduced or what porsche has introduced in recent days about heat pump based concept of hvac systems right so again that that goes into higher complexities uh, so where you study uh, uh, involvement of uh, create drawing the heat from atmosphere or absorbing the heat from battery or motor and stuff like that so but yeah that's at a very complex level but if if it is not to start with so you could at least have a very simple hvac system as well similarly in the motor side so as we are discussing before we are expecting to estimate the temperature of the motor and define the desired temperature uh, you estimate the energy consumed to bring the battery or a motor from uh, its current temperature to a desired temperature so you would estimate the energy consumed at the battery this is some of the simulation studies that are done okay if the battery's desired temperature is about 20 i'm just giving you a a rough example so that okay it is reached 30 and you want to bring it back to 20 and you know what is the basically uh, cooling power required and then you know uh, for that what is the de desired requirement at the battery as well and similarly we could also go for a battery cooling and a battery heating uh, so there you can study if there is a desired temperature how do you study the uh, you know uh, energy consumed for the the battery cooling as well so at the end of the day, we, we tabulate all of this with specific kind of uh, uh, results in place. And this is a very simple table, but obviously it won't be this simple as possible because you would be running more than about, as I said, 50 to 80 test cases. And that itself will be somewhere about like, you know, 500 pages of a document just to see all of your results at various different graphs in place. So with all of that, and you, you, you come to a conclusion that, okay, this is what your right component sizes are, and this is how you desiredly designed a possible system and you never believe your uh, simulations at the first point and you go back and perform your real-time test conditions you get results you implement in the simulation model you constantly go back to a real-time testing come back to a simulation and then conclude most of your uh, and a simulation to a, a practicality uh, possibilities of, of results in place so this is why you perform simulations um, it's it's just a long story in a, a short bit of uh, 45 minutes right so but yeah i would say that this is not everything but but this is a glimpse of it that there's a lot of job to be done on on, on, on a powertrain side to choose what you want to uh, build and then only on top of it you build things uh, that make make it to work or possibly that that they perform uh, in good conditions so with this i you know, complete my part of the session. If you have any questions, uh, you can please ask. The rest of the discussions will be done by Krishna to give you a run through of a very simple models uh, without considering a lot of auxiliary loads and stuff like that. So uh, if you have any questions for until now uh, that you have, we have discussed. So over to you for the queries.
Uh, any questions from anyone? Okay, so in continuation with this discussion, so Krishna would run you through the simulation models. Uh, Harry, uh, which simulation environment is best? I mean, uh, you know, if, if you are a s established company, I think you're asking asking about software. Is that what you meant, uh, Mr. Harry? Uh, so, okay. I think tools like MATLAB, Altair, uh, and uh, GT Suit, uh, Ricardo, you know, all these are great toolboxes. Uh, we see various different companies using various different toolboxes uh, that typically depend upon the availability of licenses and uh, technical talent that is there. But a, a, as such, you could, you could go ahead with any simulation toolboxes because all of them may have equivalent competencies and some of them have definitely good or great in certain certain you know uh, options in place, but yeah, you could build models in in any of the toolboxes as well. There is, uh, if you want to see a very simplicity, then you could go for uh, models where it is just plug and play, you know. Uh, but yeah, if you want to develop everything from the start, so you could go for a uh, models that you can build with equations. How can we take this forward from this class? Okay, so it depends upon what you expect. If you want to build your career uh, in the areas of powertrain to become powertrain development engineer or a powertrain test engineer or various of these things, uh, you could definitely learn by yourself too with available sources on the internet. Or else decibels also have programs which can help you to build your profile and portfolio to kickstart your career as well. And I, I, I don't know if that is what you're expecting. How do you take it out from this class? So yeah, you could learn to build all these models uh, with our courses at Decibles Lab. How frequently an EV manufacturer does simulation in a year? See, if, if you want to bring any new product line into the market, so you have to perform simulations, right? So um if you take like marathi right so if you want to just bring any model into the market which may be a one product so that is definitely requiring a simulation so if you want to bring let's say there is a hatchback sedan muv suv all of this right so in a year if they are releasing about uh, five products or six products I think not right now as EV, but yeah, in the future it will be. All of the OEMs are already working on this direction, right? So that is when you require, it is not like, you know, you finish a one project and there is no, no task for five years, but if you want to bring the whole product into a, until to a, a release stage uh, to sign off for, for you know, uh, full scale production and then, you know, validation has been approved in place. So you would perform all your simulations. If you're done with one model, then there is a next product line coming into a picture. If that is done, there's a new product line. Maybe you worked on SUV, you're gonna work on MUV, something of that sort. So it, it is not like one project, but it's just a continuous activity that happens with one product or another product. Is it absolutely necessary to simulate all the mentioned parameters? Are there some parameters that are good to have in some or must to have? All right, so absolutely it's, it's not necessary to have everything depending upon what, accuracy of data that you're trying to expect. In the reality, it is an egg and chicken. You know, not that you will have all the data, right? See, if you want to calculate coefficient of rolling resistance, I mean, it's just not easy for you to just get a data, particularly for the specific tire and road conditions, right? So you would just go with some thumb rules to start with. If you have experience, if you have a facility to collect the data, and if you have a manuf you know, manufacturer uh, tire who can give you that kind of a data, it's great. But if you don't have it, so then you would start at some point with some assumptions in place. Then slowly you will evolve your model and then bring correlations with the practicality of testing 
once we see that okay what is your difference if the difference is about like 20% from your real, you know, realistic conditions to a simulation so you would go back to your bench and start looking around where do you go wrong so if you feel that any of those parameters are influencing then you make those parameter correct and then you bring your simulation model to a good extent all right so i think yeah, i answered your question uh Great. So I'll stop sharing my screen at this point. So Krishna, over to you to uh, share your screen. Uh, so any questions, if you have still, you could drop your questions also on the chat box as well. Uh, over to you, Krishna, for the other discussions. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Sula. Um, hello, Bipa. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll be talking about Sorry, yeah. Uh, I will be talking about like uh, modeling point of view. Okay, like how we can go for like modeling and the approach, how or uh, what all approaches we can go for it. Okay, yeah. So basically uh, like we can like go for like quasi-static approach. Uh, it is nothing but a backward facing modeling. And then there is a dynamic approach or like forward facing modeling of your vehicle. So I'll just quickly overview like what exactly these are. And I will take you to the like simulation environment to show you like how we can simulate the things. So basically like uh, in the backward facing modeling, so we'll be estimating on the wheel side. Okay. Uh, like what are, what all the parameters influencing your vehicle movement. Okay. So considering all those things, like we are going to estimate uh the power or like the torque requirement like speed requirement to overcome all the uh you know the parameters which are influencing your movement of your vehicle okay the forward motion of your vehicle let's say like these uh, those are like uh, resistive forces so we are like we are going to model all the resistive forces and we are going to estimate okay uh, like what exactly the parameters uh, with the variable speed uh, like we'll be using the drive cycles, okay? And later, like with the help of uh, like the vehicle parameters, like we are going to uh, size the motor. Uh, like in the motor part, like we know that torque is the one parameter we need to know, motor speed, motor power. And uh, like, again, in the motor torque, we are going to define with nominal torque, or uh, continuous torque, peak torque, Okay, or like nominal and continuous, or like, yeah. And even with the speed, okay. And same with the power. So after that, uh, like we are going to uh, go for sizing of the batteries. Okay, from the batteries, we are going to get like, what is the current requirements? Okay, we know like this, this is directly proportional to your torque, the current, uh, and the speed is going to deal with the, uh, uh, like, voltage of your battery yeah so we are going to define all those things like uh, by knowing uh, like si sizing of the cell that we are going to define okay uh, by knowing the current requirements uh, and the energy and for what range we are going to define and how much energy has consumed uh, for total range which we are defined and also like energy consumed per kilometer Okay, that we are going to define. Uh, the thing is that it is from wheel to uh, well approach. Okay, by knowing what exactly required at the uh, wheel side. So, uh, like about the forward facing. Okay, so here we will be defining uh, like the available power and the torque. So, with the help of like driver model. Uh, like we will be defining ideal driver model. Like we won't be involving uh, like many characteristics of the driver. Okay. Uh, like the mood of the driver uh, or like how he may be like uh, driving aggressively, like, oh, like based on his mood, right? So we won't be involving all those things. Uh, ideal characteristics can be involved here uh, in terms of, because we need to define those uh, driver behavior in terms of e equation 
uh, mathematically. So yeah. So again, like you will be using our uh, drive cycle has a feed feeding to your model. So uh, with available like motor torque and the power, so which you are defining uh, like power and the torque. So we are making use of those things like uh, whether we can reach uh, the actual speed which is produced by that uh, like from the vehicle body. Okay, so whether the given power and the torque uh, is it sufficient or not? Uh, like that we can study. So basically, uh, like the dynamic approach, uh, we say that uh, it's a more accurate compared to the quadratic. So we can exactly know uh, the exact value. Uh, what power or the torque required okay and you can also tune uh, we can also do the performance analysis uh, like performance means basically like uh, if this is the power given and the torque is available so how many seconds it will take uh, to reach 60 uh, kilometer per hour okay or like 90 kilometer per hour uh, if you want to reach 90 km per hour within five seconds. So how much power or the torque or torque is required that we can study. Okay. So this is a, like a overview of the basic. Uh, actually, like a lot of things are involved, like when it comes to modeling uh, the models. Okay. So yeah, I'll just take you to the MATLAB um, or the simile so that so do you provide courses on crash analysis of, okay. Um, Anup Chans, uh, can you like specify your question? Like, uh, like in, do you provide course on crash analysis of EVs? Uh, I think, uh, I need to, no, I think so. Like not on crash basis, uh, like it's completely like, these are sizing. Okay, how do we take this as a business? Yeah, uh, like definitely like we have a contact with you. Uh, yeah, there we can discuss it, discuss the things. So yeah, I'll just uh, know the admin for it. Yeah. So any questions on the like overview of it, like before going to the MATLAB, just let me know. I'll just, otherwise like we can work quickly. Yeah. So uh, like, I'll just work through you about the script. Okay. So like we have some set of parameters uh, like which we are defining uh, so that we are going to use these parameters uh, in our model. Okay. Yeah. Uh, like in the models, let me show, open the models here. So this one is the quadratic approach, which we were discussing, uh, like that is backward facing. So getting know about on the vehicle side uh, means uh, on the wheel side, we will be designing our motor and the battery, like sizing the com uh, components. Okay, so here you are like feeding a drive cycles, uh, like it's nothing but like velocity upon time. So from this uh, like vehicle body, we are getting torque as a speed wheel, uh, respect to the wheel as output. And we are making use it in this transmission model. Okay, so there we can going to define the motor torque and the speed. And later we'll be using it in the motor. Okay. Uh, like to estimate the motor power and the region. Okay. Here the region, uh, like we'll be defining that uh, the possible region which we can get from the, uh, like the drive cycle which we use. Okay. Yeah. And next we'll be like defining in the motor controller and later for the battery sizing.
So I'll just take you like in worry of it. So we'll be stimulating like dynamic force, rolling force, gradient force, acceleration force. And we'll be like calculating the total force and, and the total torque and the speed required. And then for we'll be moving into this transmission. Okay. And the motor model. So here we'll be defining like motor region and the motor controller part. And this will be like battery sizing. So we can also like study here like with and without region, uh, how it's going to affect the range of your vehicle. And with with uh, with that, we can also estimate SOC. Okay, and the number of cells uh, required, uh, like total number of cells, and the energy consumed per kilometer. Okay, and the battery sizing we can make. Okay, yeah. So just let me know if you have any questions on this particular model or we can move to the next approach. Yeah. I'm just giving the overview of it, okay. So this is about uh, like dynamic approach. So here we are going to define the driver model. And here, uh, like we'll be mentioning the available power on the motor side, the torque availability, or like limiting our things, we can do it in this particular model. And later, uh, like with the help of like uh, net torque required and the net friction on the brake side, okay, now we'll be getting uh, this, uh, we'll be estimating the motor speed and the total tractive force. So from the tractive force, we'll be deriving the speed uh, like using the Newton's equation, okay? And I'm comparing the actuality, uh, sorry, the actual velocity which is produced, right? So we will be comparing with the reference velocity, okay? So we are, we are going to like uh, see like how it's going to be. Okay, let me, run this model and show you the results of comparing the both velocities. So, yeah. So this is uh, like the velocity profile. So if I just say, so this is your, uh, like from the data set uh, that is, okay, it has given named as a gain, right? So it is from this particular uh, output of the gain. Now it is nothing but like reference velocity for now you can consider. And if I select this uh, subsystem part, uh, that is nothing but uh, this particular, which is the velocity which is produced. If I both make the visible, okay, let me, you can see there is some difference uh, at here. Okay, if I supply a uh, very less energy, uh, like you can see the changes. Let me show that thing. So this is a power uh, in watts. Uh, for now, I'll just make it, let me make it 10 kilowatt. Okay, if I say run, now you can see the changes. Uh, okay, so the, the pattern of this blue graph, uh, it was not able to match with the reference speed because of not available power uh, on the motor side. Okay, uh, like all these can be studied. Okay, I'm just, I'm just showing one example here. Uh, with the help of this model, you can go for like uh, performance analysis. Yeah. So just let me know, uh, like if you have any uh, 
questions with respect to the modeling part? Uh, we can we can also like put the chat in the chat box or like message in the chat box if you have any queries. Yeah, I'll just stop sharing the screen. Right. Um, yeah. Does anybody have any questions uh, regarding the discussions that we have done till now? So over to you uh, for for any queries. So we would be glad to <clears throat> answer to them to the best of our knowledge. Uh, any questions uh, from anyone? Okay, so we're looking forward to hear from you. Any questions uh, you have, let us know that we would be happy to help you. So, okay, so we see some questions here. Can we have any fundamental level modeling course? Um, yeah, sure, Satish, I think I can give you a run through of the course that we could help you out with. And uh, let me just share my screen and you know give you a run through of the uh, process as well. Um, just a second here. Okay, so uh, if you visit our website, uh, lms.decibelslab, uh, if anybody is interested to pursue their passion specifically in powertrain and they want to develop and become themselves as a part-time engineers. We have one of the master course that is for nine months, which is with 100% placement guarantee as well. Uh, if it, if you're very much dedicated and have a desired plan of, you know, you want to become a part-time engineer, so this is a course which talks completely in depth about development, uh, design and development of part-time simulation studies, real-time testing and validations and stuff like that. So then if somebody is only focused towards batteries and algorithms, so we have a course on that. I think one of the very unique course in the country itself as on the algorithm development itself. And then if you would like to explore this in uh, small bits and pieces, uh, we have a course uh, which is on micro specialization in BEV systems and also on algorithms as well. So yeah, those are the courses that we have. And apart from that, we also have some short courses that we call it as a certification courses. So these courses are available here. Uh, yeah, somewhere here. So on electric vehicle powertrain modeling, uh, you could start your course. And I think uh, quasi static part of the course, uh, the quasi static part of the modeling is basically taught, taught through this course. Um, yeah, that's in a, a quite overview what kind of courses we have for your relevance of studies. We have, we have a bad starting if somebody is interested to build your career uh, totally and, and, and completely in battery management systems. So we have an upcoming batch that is uh, in the month of June, uh, I would say end of June, which is on uh, powertrain modeling. Yeah, if, if anybody is interested, so uh, this is the program for you to build your professional career. Uh, this is completely focused towards, uh, you know, uh, becoming a part an engineer or testing and validation engineer or at a vehicle level or at a component level or on the benchmarking uh, EV engineer or test performance evaluation engineer or integration or also on the testing of cells and batteries and homologations and certifications in place. So this is a dedicated course that is for engineers, as I said, to build the, the program and disabled promises a placement guarantee as well, along with the course. So yeah, that's that's about the course. If you are interested to you know, learn and, and build your career as a part of it, or if you're looking for bits and pieces in a short way, so you can also take up other short courses that is available on our platform as well. Great. So. Um, any questions from anyone? And uh, if, if there's no questions uh, as of now, so we have an option 
uh, here to generate your certificates. Uh, so I have shared a link uh, here on the chat box. Uh, so there is an option for you to generate your certificate. All you have to do is just click on that link and then uh, you have to go to, you will land in our website. Uh, it may look something like this, right? And then you can just click on enroll for free. And this link is only, okay, I think you're not able to see the part of the screen. Uh, just a second, yeah. If you click on that link, so you would see, you, you would land up in a website web page like this. You could just click on enroll for free, and then you would be able to follow up on the instructions to generate your certificate, right? So that's the pretty straightforward and simple procedure. And the website will be active only for about a few hours. So if you're expecting to make that happen, so uh, jump in quickly and uh, generate your certificates for participation in the webinar. So, so any questions uh, for anyone? If no questions, so before you leave uh, from the session, so do share us your feedback. How was the session and uh, was it useful? Was it informative? Or if you're expecting anything of similar in the future, you can let us know uh, that we will be able to uh, create or curate the programs for your interest as well. So uh, we would be very glad to hear from you. Do you have any automated guide vehicle course? Uh, okay. Yeah, we do uh, have a program on autonomous vehicles as well. I think if you are interested to produce those courses, uh, I think you could take up some of our micro specializations. Right now, it is the only one uh, available. We don't have a batch right now running for the autonomous vehicles. I can just show you around uh, which programs can be suitable. Okay, if you're interested in autonomous vehicles, any of these two courses are preferable, which is micro specialization on computer vision, also a micro specialization on advanced driver assistance systems. So those are the two courses that can be ideally suitable uh, for you if you would like to explore something in the areas of ADAS and autonomous vehicles. Right, so again, for everyone, uh, the way to generate your certificates is go to this link that has been shared at the chat box, click on that button, which is called enroll for free, and then you will be able to follow the instructions to generate your certificate. Do ensure that your names are correctly entered in your profile when you created your account. If the names are incorrect, then the certificate will also come with an incorrect name. So ensure that you will be having a correct name before you generate the certificate. Okay. So I think, yeah, that's all from our side. Uh, by the way, thanks a lot everybody for participating in the session today. It was fantastic interacting with you. Uh, and if you have any learning interest for the future, so you always feel free to contact us. We have dropped our numbers and looking forward to help you in learning and building your career. Again, thanks a lot for everyone for making your time uh, today for the uh, session. So, great. So again, yeah, thanks a lot everyone. Uh, good night uh, and enjoy your week. Thank you. And thanks a lot Krishna for uh, you know, having uh, uh, sharing an interactive session. Cool, so that, I think that's it professionally for the part of the session. So if anybody have any questions, you can stay back and drop them in the chat box. We will be staying back another two, three minutes uh, to conclude the session.